All right, welcome back everyone to some more Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, the Deep Elf Fire Elementalist tutorial series. I forgot to get my Google Docs up. Thankfully, with the power of Google Autofill, I'm able to do that without going into all of my shit. Feels good, man. All right, anyway. Um, so I left a, so video two was kind of uh, fairly mostly, uh, mostly the same of, as video one. Unfortunately, it's kind of a problem with um, doing these kind of like tutorial videos so slowly you do tend to repeat a lot of stuff but that's fine I'm gonna identify both of these rings because they were with me for a while and I think I just want to keep them teleportation ring definitely doesn't want to be in our inventory at all though so I said I oh wow I might just be dead here okay so the thing I did where there was move up twice uh, move left twice the reason why I did that is because the Orc Priest actually can't smite me and stay in line of sight at the same time. He can smite me as I go upstairs and I might just die. Or he could just not do that. So I was quite lucky this time around. This Imp is invulnerable to all fire magic. So I need to run away. I don't know why this upstairs isn't here. Did I skip the upstairs floor last time? I completely forgot. Yes, I did due to the high number of enemies um, over there. I completely blanked it's been a couple of days so you have to forgive me um i will just simply kite this crimson imp behind around our spells don't actually like i said our spells don't affect him so we're kind of just out of luck when it comes to this guy but i will try to avoid uh I, if i can envenom uh envenom him with my poison weapon i should be able to deal with him pretty straightforwardly so for now, I'll just run away. If I do see him again, I'll just fight him a little bit with the dagger. But yeah, the Orc Priest was a very dangerous enemy. Uh, not one that we can easily face at this time. Um, however, if he's at full screen and we can just kind of turn the corner immediately, I think I did talk about this last time, I avoided combat with the enemy by turning corners, then uh, the fight becomes a little less dangerous. Okay, I'm getting a little bit fast here because I'm not really... Because the last video I, up I uploaded was actually the speedrun video, not uh, the tutorial video. So I'm not in the right mindset to play right now, but that's fine. Also, I just want to point out that uh, rations have been changed. So now, instead of having bread and meat and all those other rations, you only have two, uh, one type of ration and only one food type in general. So this is going to help streamline the slot issues uh, quite, a, quite a lot. They've also removed mutagenic chunks. Thank goodness. I've never really liked them. I mean, they've never really been a game mechanic for me, so it doesn't. Re it's completely irrelevant to me. So uh, I find that it'll have very little in terms of gameplay um, effect. There is, of course, the Fedass uh, thing being changed. So Fedass now only uses rations to fuel her, which makes no no sense at all. But you know, whatever. Fuck logic in the case of um, you know making way for dev design, I suppose. Like now, Fedass is the god of bread. Uh, because her, all her abilities cost bread or piety to use. Alright, so I've just tabbed through that Crimson Imp. The Crimson Imp isn't horribly threatening for this character, even in melee, but they are immune to my weapon, uh, my armor, so what I had to do there was just kind of smack him down with my dagger. So I'm going to use Sticky Flame this guy. Uh, I actually miscast. I'm not sure if I can Sticky Flame him. No, I cannot. Okay, so that's good. I just needed to check. So the enemy here cannot be Sticky Flamed. I'm just going to try to Flame Tongue him instead. Flame Tongue, again, is a very mana efficient, fairly strong weapon, so I'm happy to use it. Um, uh, sorry, it's a very very strong tool for one mana. Okay, so I could have engaged that Orc Priest right there, but instead I'm going to go all the way back here. This is going to let me um, engage from a much further range, a bit safer, and uh, I'd also have a couple more corners to turn. In addition to that, I also was closer to the upstairs when I moved. Okay, so I'm going to probably go ahead and uh, go back upstairs, uh, identify the two brown potions. Potions of magic, these are really good for um, dealing with uh, issues, like, so I, I said before, mana is your health, right? So potions of magic are actually pretty much potions of heal wounds, um, sort of but only for offense for a mage. So it's a very powerful tool in certain situations, but generally speaking, you shouldn't need to use a uh, um, a magic potion. 
Now, right there, I cast Conjure Flame in the Corridor, and the reason why I did that is because undead and certain mindless enemies will walk straight into Conjure Flame. Conjure Flame damage, if you've ever tried to walk into a fire, is extremely painful, um, and it'll generally kill everything at this stage in less than two turns if uh, if they stand in it. So, And if the enemies are smart enough to not walk into it, like the ant, uh, you can just kind of pelt them from behind the wall, and they won't go in. Certain enemies at high-ish health will not step into fires unless provoked, so um, they'll realize that there's something that is on their tile that is also a cloud effect, or they've been goaded into... Uh, they, real, they realize they're in a situation where they'll get hit constantly unless they're in the tile. Example of this is Yaks. I can't really think of another enemy that does that, but um, Yaks definitely know... Oh, if, if he's shooting at me and there's a Conjure Flame there, I'm going to die. Now, I was in a very awkward spot there, unfortunately. Um, the Conjure Flame... Uh... Okay, this is a very bad spot. Okay, let's just go upstairs. So what happened... Okay, a couple of things just happened there. The Conjure Flame was still in, uh, like, on, on the screen, and I couldn't get it to dissipate in time. The Ogre was standing there, and I was trying to just kind of get away from him. I tried to sneak around him, didn't work. Then he followed me, we're both 10 speed, he got random energy, hit me once. Random energy is this bullshit mechanic, it's RNG basically, where uh, enemies can sometimes move faster or slower per turn, basically meaning sometimes enemies can just attack you, uh, even though you're moving next to them and you're both 10 speed. It's a great mechanic, it lets you get killed really easily, um, from like just bullshit. It's really shit, uh, and generally one of the biggest flaws in Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, generally speaking. Uh, it's to is to dissuade uh, pillar dancing, but generally speaking, it's more just a pain in the ass. That is uh, not really a view that is, I guess, disputed, I'd say. A lot of people just fucking hate random energy, because it's just an awful mechanic in general, but, you know, some certain devs will enjoy trying to uh, justify it, so that's why we have it. Feels good, man. I feel like I'm being a little salty about this uh, when we get through these tutorial videos, but you know, I gotta air my grievances out somehow, right? Okay, so Fireball is almost down to 16%. That's pretty good. I think soon I will turn one of these down or start training fighting um, just to get myself a bit more defense. I feel a little bit weak right now in terms of the defense. I can feel the offense coming through, but defense wise, we are a little bit off kilter. So I'm just gonna have to go ahead and train fighting at some point. Probably not immediately, maybe a little bit after Temple. Okay, so Sif Muna's vo uh, vault is there. Um, she is one of the two magic gods that you'll ever pick with a mage or a pure mage, the other one being the Um But we'll talk about them when we hit the Hummet altar and I'll t tell you guys why I'd pick the Hummet over Sif. Um, and I'll probably talk about those in a bit as well. Okay, that doesn't look like a vault. Uh, a temple vault, I hope. Because if it is, we're screwed. Just gonna back off here. Again, note that um, I'm not really getting in melee with too much stuff. If they do get in melee with me, I try to avoid being in melee by moving back or casting my anti-personnel move, i.e. Sticky Flame. And also keep in mind that I am trying very hard to keep my mana kind of high uh, throughout the encounters. So, like right here, I've only lost about 6 mana, about 7, so that's about half my mana. That's pretty safe still, I'd say. Uh, once this frog gets in the way, though, I'm just going to start running back. Run a little bit more towards the known, heal up, and then continue on with my way. This method is very useful, and it's generally the method that you're going to, uh, the strategy that you're going to use every single time you play uh, mage in general. Oh yeah, that's right, okay. So let's talk a little bit more, let's expand a little bit more on the idea of spell slots. So last last video, I said that uh, spell slots are these, or well, spell levels, I would say, are a limited resource that you can use to le uh, memorize certain levels of spells. So right now I have used, uh, let's see, 12, 17 spell levels worth of spell levels. Right, and I've got, oh, I've used 15. What? Am I not, can I not add? Hang on, hold, hold on. Hold the phone. 6, 9, 13, 15. Oh, I'm dumb. Okay, I got 15 out of 20 spell levels right now uh, being used. I can increase that with leveling up or 
um, spell cost, uh, increasing your spell costing, or I can forget spell level, uh, forget a spell using Amnesia Scrolls to get more spell levels. Also, I picked up a, a spell book, which is why I kind of want to talk about it right now. Okay, so let's 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 just talk a little bit about what kind of spells we're looking for here. A mage generally has uh, a couple of categories of spells. The first one, the most obvious one, is going to be your offense spells, right? So I'm just going to write that down real quick. Offense, so types of slots. I'm going to call them slots because these are... Uh, I'm effectively just telling you this. A character needs some kind of way of killing stuff, which is your offense. Some kind of way of surviving stuff, which is your defense. And then stuff that kind of does a little bit of A and a little bit of B, or it does neither, which is the utility stuff. So the offense is generally the only thing the mage really needs. Technically, everything else can be covered by uh, consumable usage or strategy in general. However, I'm going to break down offense into a number of different things. So I talked a little bit last time about the three types of offense. Number one is going to be your mana efficient spell. So for example, in this case here, I would say that a mono efficient spell is flame tongue. And the reason why is because it's one mana spell, fairly accurate, and fairly high damage for this level uh, right now. Like, whoops. So a mono efficient spell is uh, the slot, I'd say, out of our offense that is. Mana uh, is, is the one that we use most of the time because it's able to achieve the goal of killing the enemy in the least amount of mana possible. The, uh, the bonus of having small mana costs um, with fairly high damage or accuracy and accuracy is that you can kind of gauge how much mana you need to spend because flame tongues are, you know, very, very divisible units. You can use them one mana at a time, so you can burn one mana. That's why I'd say that. Uh, for our mono efficient spell right now, so I'm looking at our spell list, we have Flame Tongue. Now, the issue, the downside with this spell is, of course, that it is low range. So the next spell slot that we want is our range spell. So this is um, sort of covered by Throw Flame. However, it is also completely destroyed by Fireball. Right? So. The reason why I say this is because flame t Throw Flame has full screen range, Fireball has almost full screen range. They have very comparable ranges, but Fireball is going to be your ranged ability. Why? Because Throw Flame is extremely mana inefficient. Um, so I did say mana efficient spell, um, but that is a little bit different from what I mean here. What I mean in this case is that this spell is more mana efficient and has better range, uh, but our most mana efficient spell is still Flame Tongue. So if we need to kill a dude in as little mana as possible, we can go Flame Tongue um, or Fireball, right? Our range spell, though, is just going to be Fireball because at this stage in the game, again, uh, Throw Flame is effectively worthless. Our damage spell is one that might be less mana efficient, but it's the thing that we use to kill everything, right? So the stuff, if something needs to die really quick, we want to have that kind of slot covered by a spell. Right now, what's being covered by that spell? I would say probably Fireball or Sticky Flame. So Fireball and Sticky Flame are what we cost when we need to get this guy real dead, real quick, right? Um, sorry, I need to check the audio. Hello? Okay, great. Sorry. Uh, so that's... I'm just trying to point out what kind of spells we're looking for in our, in our starting book, in our spell... Uh, arsenal in general. So we want mana efficiency, we want things with range, we want things with damage. Um, and these are going to be the things that we have. Note that Sticky Flame is also mana efficient, note that Fireball is also mana efficient, note that Flame Tongue is also mana efficient. So it's really hard to say, uh, to use this example right now. However, there are going to be a lot of times when a lot of the spells that you use are going to be just one of these things. The reason why fi uh, Fire Elementalist is so damn good is because all of these things kind of do multiple things. Fireball is mana efficient, ranged, and damaged. Sticky Flame is mana efficient and damaged. Uh, and Flame Tongue is just super mana efficient. Uh, so there's like a lot of spells that are really insanely good. Uh, which is again why Fire Elementalist ranks among one of my top uh, most recommended spell books. Um, okay. Now... 
the one the one thing that we are missing though is irresistible is our is our like I would say off element spell. So what off element spell? What what I mean by that is, if I need someone dead but he's immune to a certain element, can I kill that enemy? For example, if we were to fight an orb of fire for some insane reason right now, our spell list is purely fire damage, meaning that we do not have a way of dealing any damage whatsoever. Probably the more accurate way of saying that is Crimson Imp, right? Crimson Imp is immune to our spell right now, uh, to our fire spells, and thus we have a completely like large gaping hole in our, our arsenal. We can't kill uh, any enemy that is resistant to or immune to fire. But generally speaking, we're looking for some spell like Iron Shot or something to cover this area. Generally, Orb of Destruction is the premium spell for off element because it is not only extremely damaging but it's also extremely ranged being one tile off of full screen range which you guys will talk uh, which i'll talk about later it's also completely irresistible by um by elements and it's also entirely undodgeable if it actually is going to collide with the guy um again i'll explain the the beauties and the wonder of orb of destruction in a little bit more detail when i actually do get to that point the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because we have a second book that we picked up. We recently picked up the Book of Minor Magic. This is the starting magic spell book. Now, uh, sorry, for Wizard. Now, I just want to talk about this for a second because this is kind of relevant to how, uh, to the to the mage, like, like we can talk about spell slots, I guess, with the, with the Book of Minor Magic starting book. So the Book of Minor Magic comes with Magic Dart, Blink, Call Imp, Slow, Conjure Flame, and Mephitic Cloud. Now, you would have to ask, given this exact like book, how would I allocate all of my slots? Magic Dart is a one mana, full screen range, in, uh, undodgeable spell. It is mana efficient as hell, and it's extremely long range, and it's very good for accuracy as well. So it's probably going to be fitting in our uh, mana efficient ranged and damage spells. We actually have no other damage spells and uh, direct damage spells in the book. Meaning that that is pretty much the premium damage spell, other than Call Imp. Call Imp is our secondary damage spell. It's also extremely minor efficient. Its range is kind of a uh, question mark, I would say. But as you can see from this book, there's actually not that much in terms of damage, which is why, again, uh, Wizard tends to be not as recommended as a starting book. It's really good if you can use all the tools in it that translates into quote, uh, quotation marks damage. But if you can't do that, you're basically stuck with Magic Dart and Call Imp, which makes it a little bit... Mm. However, he does have a lot of utility spells, which is something that we don't have as, an, as a fire uh, elementalist. And I'm going to call these utility spells... Um, do not take up a slot. So utility spells generally don't take up a slot. The reason why I say that is because each spell that is a utility spell, for example, uh, for example Conjure Flame... Uh, serves a specific purpose that gives you a specific utility. So Conjure Flame is a very specific utility. It cannot be uh, replicated by pretty much any other spell at that spell level as well. Conjure Flame can block off corridors, it can cause damage directly with insanely high damage if you get it in the right condition. Uh, you can use it to you know, narrow fights down, you can use it to dissuade enemies from walking in a certain way. You can do a whole bunch of different things with it. But it's not a damage spell, it's not a range spell, it's not a it's not a mana efficient spell at all. So that's why I put it in the utility spell. The second one that we would get is Blink. Blink is another spell that's incredibly good in your in your spell. Utility is also sometimes can also sometimes be called defense. So I'm gonna call it defense as well. Because again, it offers you something that is uh, not measurable by pure damage or pure mana efficiency. Blink is an incredibly good spell. Uh, basically, uh, what it does is it randomly translocates the cast for a short distance. So anywhere on the screen, uh, just goes boop, and then suddenly you're there. For two mana, it is effectively a blink spell, uh, a blink scroll, if you're able to use it in the right conditions. Or it could be a four mana blink scroll. Uh, blink scroll. So basically, you just recast until you get a good good result. For two mana, it's good for mana efficiency, though you really don't get any positive damage dealt to. Uh, the opponent by using these two mana, so you can't really call it mana efficiency, 
but it has utility in that it's really defensive. So the spell book for Wizard is really good, which is why I'm talking so much about it. It's actually insanely good if you know what you're doing. Mephitic Cloud is a great utility spell that also deals a little bit of damage, uh, it confuses everyone that it hits, it, or it confuses things that it hits if they're not poison or magic resistant. But generally it's a really good spell uh, to combine with uh, Conjure Flame, which we might pick up in a bit. But I think for the time being, we'll try to stick to most of the core elements of fire, uh, rather than going to Call Imp and Mephitic Cloud, just because I want to keep it mostly simple. And if I do another wizard one, we can talk about all the wizard tips and tricks uh, behind, you know, like, sorry, behind all that stuff. So yeah, we'll, we'll just leave that for there for now. Uh, but we will pick up Blink because that's a... Every single mage wants to get this book. It's why the Magic uh, Book of Minor Magic is often always bought, because you want Blink. Uh, it has no real level restriction, I suppose. Like, literally, from... From level 1, oh sorry, from level I'd say like 4 to level 27, everyone wants Blink. Um, just because it's such a good utility that's hard to come by. Anyway, so now that I feel a little bit more uh, comfortable with our Fireball training, so it's down to 12% due to my hefty training in Conjurations and Fire Magic, I'm considering picking up a little bit, a couple of points in Translocations. Generally, Blink wants to be as consistent as it can, so I'm going to try to bring it down to about 6 to 4%. If I'm able to do that, I should be able to get some pretty hefty returns uh, because I'll be able to blink whenever I feel like, which will give me a lot of defense. Um, there is a blink scroll up here and ration and also identify an unknown scroll. I definitely want to pick that up, but I do not have a way of dealing uh, with the fire that's going to be burning me as I go through. So I'm going to wait till I get apportation or I have a, a lot of health until I do this. Alright, so here's a Centaur and here's a Ogre. This is a good time for me to show off the power of Fireball. Fireball is a spell that casts uh, in a nice blossom effect here. Note that every single area in this Fireball will not be dodged, and every single area, uh, sorry, every single tile in this Fireball will deal the same amount of damage. So it's a really great spell because you can learn how to snipe people with it. With certain configurations of Fireball, you can actually hit multiple people and you can really uh, extend your range with it. So it's also really high damage, as you can see, it took out half the health of the Centaur, half the health of the Ogre, and it's also worth only 5 mana, which is pretty cheap. Look at that. With 2 casts, I was able to kill both of those enemies at the same time. Of course, this leaves me very weakened, because I am down to about, you know, 9 to 10 mana uh, after only 2 casts. However, at this stage in the game, it's extremely powerful for what it does. It's not mana efficient yet because of how much mana it has, but as we get higher up in the mana, it becomes much more powerful. So I think, again, as, as I said, the slot taken by uh, Throw Flame is mostly taken over by uh, Fireball at this point. As a result, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to forget Throw Flame. Throw Flame serves no real purpose at this stage in the game, ordinarily. However, for the purpose of just keeping this game on track and making sure that new players don't just randomly forget let throw flame as soon as possible, I'm going to keep the spell and I'm going to try, try to keep using it, um, assuming I don't get this amnesia. The, the advice that I'm trying to say is, if you have an overlapping slot, don't, don't just immediately remove the spell that you don't need. Um, if, obviously, you're still in a weaker state. It's mostly only if you have uh, less spell slots than you desire and you need to free up more effectively my advice boils down to try to be efficient with your spell slots the reason why is because it will maximize the amount of like it's kind of like using a subpar weapon why would you why would you ever go into battle with less uh than the best you know what i mean there is another consideration to make and that's hunger i'm gonna try to avoid talking about that because it makes me sad um I actually have no idea how the new food rations work. They have less nutrition, I think, than either the bread and the meat ration, but there's just one of them. I don't know how that really works, but okay. Anyway, we're going to leave it at that first. I picked up two star uh, staves. So staves are, um, or enhancer staves, are magical staves that basically just boost the power of certain elements, depending on what kind of staff they are. So here's... A staff of cold and here is a staff of earth okay so there's a couple of things that you need to know about these staves first of all they increase the spell power of any uh, of their elemental spells so any earth spells that i wield or any cold spells that i wield 
uh, will be boosted at this point in time. They used to make you weaker at the opposite. So earth would make you worse at air, cold would make you worse at fire, but this is no longer the case. Um, in addition to that, the elemental uh, enhancer staves will also function as weapons for those who are actually good at using earth or their elemental spell. They're not exactly great as actual weapons though, and I would not suggest you use them as such because they are expensive to train. You need to train evocations, your elemental magic, and also staves to get it kind of down to Mindalay, and the base damage is quite bad. But if you feel like doing it, you probably can get away with it. It's not a bad weapon per se, it's just kind of not spectacular. Because I didn't find any good enhancer staves here uh, that correlate to my fire or conjurations book. Okay, I need to talk about this too. <coughs> oh my god. Because I didn't find any good enhancer staves, not really going to bother. Uh, not really going to bother withholding them. However, I will keep in mind that the Staff of Cold also grants me one pip of cold resistance, which is quite nice as well. So I'm going to hold on to that in case I need it for some reason. Okay, I booked up. I picked up the Conjurer's Book, the starting book, which comes with Magic Dart, Searing Ray, Iskenderan's Mystic Blast, Dazzling Spray, Force Lance, and Fulminant Prison. Now, I'm not going to go over the, the slots of... Uh, Conjurer, you'll eventually figure that out for yourself, but I will say this, Iskenderan's Mystic Blast actually covers a lot of the same spell slot, uh, a lot of the slots as Fireball, uh, as in that it's ranged, it's often mana efficient, it's also a damage spell, but the power of it is also that it's a, it's a, um, it's irresistible, because it's a non-elemental spell. Conjurers excel in spells that have no elemental, um, bearing whatsoever so they cannot be resisted by certain things so Iskenderan's Mystic Blast I will actually pick up despite the fact that I have such a massive over um despite the fact that I have such a massive overlap with Fireball I'm picking it merely for the off elemental spell so in this case IMB is our off element spell uh, it'll be able to kill anything that is fire resistant which is very helpful for us at this stage in the game imps come to mind but also you know certain other baddies I'm gonna drop the scroll of immolation. It's obviously useless for this character. I would never want to hold on to it. Okay, so we got a very late lair, a uh, very late temple this game. Um, usually it's between D4 and D7. Today we got on D7. Okay, the Ring of Wizardry is quite powerful. Uh, it effectively just reduces the spell failure of all of your spells by an insane amount. So here you can see that uh, the worst spell I have is Fireball at 4%, but if I remove this ring with Shift R, I can actually go check again, it goes up to 11%. So this reduces the wizardry, uh, reduces the spells. Generally speaking, most of the time, your character will be strong enough that they won't need wizardry. However, wizardry is an incredibly powerful spell, uh, tool for getting your character online very quickly. All your spells will be like like that. They'll, they'll just come online, they'll be, as you can see here, Fireball has no, essentially no fail rate, uh, which makes it completely reliable to use. Now only mana is my limiting factor. Which is very good for me, obviously. Later on, it'll be a little bit less important as all my spells will naturally hit 1%, but for the time being, no. Alright, so this is a special temple. This is the Slime Temple, meaning there's a uh, there's altars of Jivia, the Slime God. But there are also some still uh, there are also some gods here, and one of them is the Humit, which we were going to go to. Now, there are two gods in this game that uh, a mage would really want to go for. The third one you could argue is Ashen Zari, but I don't like talking about him because he's not directly a mage god, he's just kind of a everything god, uh, which is why I try to avoid talking about him. Alright, the two gods we got is are Vahumit and Sif Muna. So Sif Muna was the blue one we saw earlier. Let's talk about both of them in turn. Okay, so Sif Muna. She has... Um, she is the god of mana, effectively. Her abilities are to uh, provide you with the this thing called uh, divine energy, which effectively makes it so that you can cast spells at zero or negative mana. Uh, you can go into the negatives. So effectively what it is is you have a buff on that's perm basically permanently on. If you drop to below to low mana, you can still cast any spell you want for one one time only, um, and then it goes into the negative mana, which or it goes to zero, and then it puts you onto minus cast for a short amount of time. 
um, depending on how much mana overboard you went. This is very helpful for players because effectively it means that no matter what, you always have one extra spell in the hole, whether it be a Firestorm, a level 9 spell, an Orb of Destruction, or a Blink. Uh, and it basically says, all right, no matter what, you get one free spell. So it's very helpful for those people who are very bad at managing mana because it provides them with um, extra mana effectively. Additionally, she provides you with book gifts later on, so she gifts you books, which will have spells, uh, a lot of them, and almost indefinitely. Uh, she also allows you to amnesia freely, meaning your spell slots are much more flexible, and also she provides you with the ability to channel mana. So like Trog's, Trog, uh, like Trog's Hand, you can regenerate mana at a very rapid rate. This is a quite a uh, piety-intensive activity, though, so I would suggest not doing it too many times. So what are the benefits of this guy? Well, you have mana efficiency. Sorry, mana, mana, um, how do I, how do I, how would I say this? Hand holding your mana effectively. So, uh, mana boosting, uh, spell flexibility, and spell variety. So basically what I'm saying is you can change your spell arsenal when you feel, uh, and you also get access to more spells. Also, you get more boosting, uh, boost, boosted mana, so you can basically play with more mana. Downsides, not Vahuma, basically. That is the downside of uh, Sif Mini. You don't, you pick Sif Mini, you can't pick Vahuma. So, what is the difference between uh, Sif Mini and Vahuma? Well, Vahuma is basically the god of conjurations. Um, what that means is he is very, very focused on conjurations compared to Sif Mini, who's more of an all-around magic god. Vahuma provides you with the ability to gain... Um, conjuration attack based spells uh, over time he gifts you like attack based spells every so often that you can memorize uh, it's in your memorize menu um, later on at your max pip of fighter he gives you access to three high level conjurations like firestorm shatter whatever um, which generally you don't use that much that often uh, gen i mean generally you don't like memorize them at all in a three ring game but you know it's useful sometimes he also gives you mana on kill, similar to how McCleb gives you health on kill, um, which is quite useful. The mana you get on kill is not quite as much as McCleb's healing, but it's enough to generally get you through a sustained fight. It's pretty good. Um, also, and most importantly, he provides you with the power to get extra range on your conjuration spells. And this is the thing that makes me completely say that I'd like that puts me in the camp strongly that Vahumin is the best beginner god for a mage. Even though Sif Muna provides you with more mana efficiency and she gives you more room to make mistakes with your spells and your mana, the Hummet provides you with the power of range. Now, I said in the earlier video, I believe, that mages live and die by their range. Mages that are in melee are effectively dead men or women or whatever in between. The Hummet provides you with one extra tile of range on almost every single conjuration spell in the game, which makes him incredibly potent, incredibly safe. He turns a regular mage into an artillery because now suddenly your fireball can hit full screen. Suddenly your um, your bolt of fire is full screen. Suddenly your iron shot goes from pathetic piss poor range to I guess I can work with this range. He makes it incredibly, uh, your mage, much safer and much more deadly. You can think of it as one extra attack in the beginning of a fight, compared to Sif Muna, who will give you one extra attack at the end of the fight, because Sif Muna's negative energy versus Vahumet's one extra tile of range. But when you think about it with a, when you think about it in terms of AOE, like say for example Fireball, say for example I can cast Fireball to um, this tile here. All right, actually, this is kind of a bad uh, area to be displaying these talents. Say, for example, I shoot a fireball right here. Notice how many tiles I can hit. One, two, three, four, five. Outside of my effective range with fireball, I can hit five extra tiles. Now, if somehow I was able to hit here, notice, or anywhere in between this line, notice how many extra tiles of range I can get. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Effectively, I can get nine free tiles worth of damage if I really need to. Uh, obviously, I can't hit all of them at once, but I can hit the five extra tiles way further out. So I can hit like 
three guys over here, and then I can hit three guys over here, and then next turn I can pull back to this range and get a free attack again, meaning I can get another five guys. So it's an incredibly powerful tool. So I would say God of... I know that sounds dumb, God of Artillery, but he is absolutely the God of Artillery. Benefit, range, plus, plus, plus. It's incredibly important to play with range on a mage. So, having said that, I will definitely be picking Vahumet this early in the game. I can, I will say that Sifmoon is perfectly viable, but there's a reason why I, I always use the meme, Stubby Fireball. Uh, Stubby Fireball refers to the regular version of Fireball, which effectively isn't anywhere near as good as the Extended Fireball. Extended Fireball is incredible. Stubby Fireball is acceptable. It just turns things into absolute mush compared to, to the Stubby Fireball. It's just, I don't know, it's just so much better. Now that we have the God taken in, we're going to leave it here because, again, I want to keep these videos fairly short to try to make it so that it's more digestible. But I hope you guys do enjoy this series. I, I've been hearing some pretty good things. People have started to, you know, latch on. It's been good. I haven't really seen any results, but, you know, it's a bit early in there. I mean, we've only gotten to temples, so it's hard to say how the mid-game and late-game goes. But I do hope that you guys, if you have already given up on the run, or you've already tried to do, um, like, a deep off yourself in the past, and you gave up during the greater player run, I hope you guys try... I guess to, to come back to it and really have a go with more of this deeper knowledge. Um, it's pretty it's pretty in-depth, I think. I mean, three videos for D7 is ridiculous for my, my pace. I literally have never gone this slowly before, not even in the other tutorials. So it's been a pretty interesting experience, I'd say. A lot of talking, especially. But hope it's been rewarding, and hopefully it does get uh, attention and gets people to play Mage a little bit more. If only to get people to get their wins with Mage, which are really difficult sometimes. Um, yeah. So, unfortunately, sorry about the late video. Uh, I've actually been playing Starbound a lot with a friend, and it's been pretty fun. We've been doing a lot of stuff, so kind of been hooked. We've been playing about, I think we've played about like seven hours today already. It's been crazy. So anyway, I'm going to leave it here so I can go play some more Starbound. Um, thank you guys very much for watching, and I will see you all next time.